never spoken here before. He is Adrian, I hope you make it a habit. He's Adrian Johnson, and his topic is an unusual topic, uh, an opinionated guide to gender politics. And Adrian Johnson has been active in gender politics in Sydney for some years. It's a very enigmatic topic, uh, Adrian, and I know you're going to live up to our best expectations. So please welcome Adrian Johnson. just imagine for a moment that you've never heard the tale of Cinderella before in your life. Imagine you have been uh, told this tale slowly over time and you're told the whole tale except one detail is missing, the detail of the glass slipper. Imagine how confused you might be when the tale ended as to the one piece of footwear that tied the story all together. I believe that something very similar has happened in the domain of agenda politics, that we have been told, more often than not, only one side of the story and not the other side. So I'm here today to give you a little bit of both sides. Admittedly, I'll be focusing on the side that I believe that has been mostly ignored. But I will certainly encourage your additions to the conversation at the end. And I certainly hope that everyone ends today a little bit more informed, even if they end up disliking me. Um, this has been a very long topic with a long history. Um, a lot of people, for example, they will know that there was a time in Australia's history and in a New South Wales history, where women did not have the right to vote. Uh, many of these people may not also know that there was a time where men did not have the right to vote. And in fact, before 1858, the right to vote was given only to people who owned a certain amount of land and or paid a certain amount of tax. This is very interesting, especially when you consider in uh, the UK, in Britain, they have actually gone back into uh, their archives and discovered that, in the UK at least, they can prove that women were voting before universal suffrage was given to women because they earned, they had, they paid the amount of taxes and they, they earned the property that was needed to be owned. So this is a very diverse topic, and it has many uh, facts that are often ignored. I'm repeating myself now, already. Um, <laughs> another uh, uh, subtopic of this that has gotten my ire as of recent events is the issue of domestic violence. Now. I just want a show of hands, if you don't mind. Who has heard of the White Ribbon Campaign? Oh. I'm surprised at how many people have not heard of the White Ribbon Campaign. Um, well, if you don't know, that is a government-funded uh, campaign on domestic violence focusing almost entirely on male perpetrators and female victims. I want you to imagine something for a moment. I'm going to do this a lot, by the way. <laughs> I want you to imagine that we are at a Remembrance Day ceremony, talking about the troops in war who have died over the years, but the speaker only acknowledges the male troops. And at the end of this talk, somebody asks him, why did you ignore purposely the women who died? Horribly in some cases. And the male speaker looks at you in a confused way and says, why, because men were the majority of the victims, and therefore it is perfectly okay for the women to be ignored. It is this very logic, gender reversed, that White Ribbon uses to focus entirely the issues on domestic violence to one gender and not the other. 
and you will see in many cases there are companies and uh, government organizations such as the Blacktown City Council that gives huge amounts of money to Black Ribbon gives and expects their employees in some cases to wear these white ribbon symbols on them so that they may be reminded about how evil men all are <laughs> and about how it's all just patriarchy, it's all just men beating on women whose only crime is maybe burning the toast once. <laughs> okay, I'm exaggerating a little, but that is often the way that the narrative is spun. Domestic violence uh, services also has a very long and interesting history. Headed by an interesting woman who is thankfully still alive. Her name is Erin Pizzi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a personal fanboy of hers. She created the very first domestic violence shelter for women and girls in the 1970s in Chiswick. London, I believe, and something very interesting happened. She surveyed her first hundred women showing up, and out of them, she was able to determine that 60 of them were at least as violent as the male partner that they were fleeing. This made her pause for a moment, as she recalled, re recalled her own abuse perpetrated onto her when she was just a little girl. So she decided to do something <laughs> that would go down in history. She decided to, well, create a domestic violence shelter for men as well. And during this time, she had written the first ever well-publicized book on domestic violence titled Scream Quietly or the Neighbors Will Hear. <laughs> a very interesting title. I'm sure you will all agree. So I want everyone to sort of imagine that this issue is finally getting government attention. It is finally getting the attention of overseas and of governments and of people around the world. It's actually getting money, it's getting funding from millionaires in some, in some cases, ensuring that the shelters can be built and maintained. Then something rather interesting happens. And this is the point where we talk about the elephant in the room up until now. You can't talk about Abraham Lincoln without talking about the Civil War. Similarly, you cannot talk about gendered uh, politics without talking about feminism, unfortunately. And if you try, well, they'll show up at your venue and pull the fire alarm, as is what happened to us on more than one occasion. But this is where I bring it up. So, feminism enters the domestic violence shelter movement, you might say, en masse. And what does it achieve? Well, as you have all heard, government attention existed beforehand, and these Shelters were getting funding, and many of them were being built. The one thing they achieved was the introduction of a thing called the Duluth model, which was, is basically patriarchy theory, but in domestic violence. They had this little circle. I don't have it to show you, but basically it's all just using male privilege. Men do this, men do that, men do whatever, and it's all in with domestic violence. And... So this Duluth model was used to achieve really two things, in my opinion. One, it was to genderize the services so that uh, male victims and lesbian victims, in many cases, would not or could not receive services for decades. The next thing it achieved, it, it achieved a very steady flow of funding from, with organizations like White Ribbon, who do absolutely nothing other than advertise their existence and make money. And get people to sign a little dotted uh, piece of paper that says, by the way, I won't beat women. 
imagine using that strategy with anybody else, of any other group. Imagine, and I said I was going to do this a lot, but I will, imagine showing up to little Muslim school, schools and asking them that they will not remain silent and they will not commit terrorist attacks. Imagine showing up to any group saying any of the negative things that have been associated with them and asking them to sign a piece of paper saying that they will not do said negative thing. Is this mine? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's a, it's a going to be a long night. Imagine the sort of outrage that would take place. So, I want... Yeah, there, there, there. So yeah, next sort of point. This is a sort of thing that has a lot of areas in it. And domestic violence is but one of many ways in which, gen in which politics have been gendered, in some cases unnecessarily, in many cases, I would argue, unnecessarily uh, gendered approaches to problems. Another rather interesting thing happened in the 1990s. From memory, I believe this was in 1996, although I might be mistaken. A uh, doctor, whose name I cannot pronounce and don't have in front of me, unfortunately, went to the UN and he had an idea. And this idea was called the male pill. It was a male contraception that he was researching. Now, he eventually found um, corporate donors to fund his research and found that his particular method unfortunately would not work on human men particularly well. So this particular method was never going to get very far, admittedly. But nonetheless, he went to the UN at the very early stages and he asked the UN for funding. And the UN told him that in order to receive funding, he must first ask the women's end of the UN, UN women, whether or not he could receive funding. It's an interesting patriarchy we live in, isn't it? <laughs> Where a male contraception, whether or not it gets funded by the patriarchy, gets decided exclusively by the female branch of government. Or at least, allegedly, the female of government. Well, obviously they said no, <laughs> and it did not get its funding, although I do stress, again, that this particular pill would not have worked. That is not the reason as to why it was denied funding from UN Women. It was denied funding because they did not wish there to be male contraception because they wanted to retain that power. And even today, um, unfortunately, when, you know, a child is conceived, all of the options really rely on the woman, woman. And some of these options, it's not that it's tilted, that's kind of fair in a way, because women have a biological uh, burden that pregnancy takes on them that simply does not happen with men. So I do not want to say that it should be 100% equal these options, but what I'm saying is 100% of the options, basically at this point, are women's options once a baby is conceived. There's the day after pill, there's abortion, not necessarily in New South Wales, that's illegal in most circumstances, I think, from memory. Yeah, uh, what is abortion? abortion. You, you have awesome. to get some kind of doctor certificate. Mm. Oh, yeah, it, was very, it's, it was very controversial recently, there was a... a, a, a uh, thing in Parliament where they wanted to make it more accessible and that was denied and it was quite the hula about it. Yeah, I remember that. Um, I mean, for the record, my opinion on this topic is that we should simply get the smartest people in a room, be it the scientists, kick the politicians out and let them make the decision and then bring those politicians back to make the correct decision based on science and based on empathy for their fellow human beings. But, that's a digression. <laughs> Um, she can, uh, in many ways, uh, pull the baby up for adoption as well, after the baby is born. 
And, it, you know, if, if the man does not wish to have a child, and he has conceived a child, maybe he was drunk one day, and he just woke up, and what the hell happened? I woke up next to this woman who's doesn't look as good as I remember when I was drunk. Well, <laughs> that's happened to a couple of friends of mine, I'll tell you. <laughs> what happens when she gets pregnant and he doesn't want to be a father? Well, he can be forced to pay child support at the very least. And sometimes only get to see his father every second week. I don't wish to give anybody the impression at all that 100% of the gender issues that exist, exist for men. I felt I should make that point again now, that what I am attempting to do is bring light to the issues that I feel that are being ignored. So I don't want any of the people in here to feel attacked or defensive, I want you to all understand that I don't, I'm not here with any hate in my heart for anybody. That being said, I have experienced terrible things in my personal life that have made me so passionate about these issues. And I'd like to go through one of them right now. Almost everyone who has ever met me knows this because I tell them because I'm a loudmouth. <laughs> but I am an ex-Jehovah's Witness. And that means that I was raised in school not allowed to uh, have any um, well, sexual relations, shall we say. And so this made me quite a safe option as a friend for many of the girls in my high school who didn't want particularly to hang out with a guy whose only interest was, well, you know. And I got along quite well with girls in my youth. In fact, most of my friends were women and girls up until I was about 18. One particular day, a group of girls that I had just met uh, maybe a week ago, were talking about one of their boyfriends, and apparently he was being a bit of an, quote, asshole to her, to this woman, who was the girl speaking. And um, so she took it upon herself to kick him in the balls. And as you can imagine, they all found this quite hilarious. They all found this quite funny. It was amusing that this woman had sexually assaulted, essentially, this man out for merely offending her. So out of curiosity, I sort of tried to get along better with the guys, and because I didn't like sport, that wasn't very easy to do. I wasn't very stereotypically masculine. I was the kind of guy to go home, watch the Powerpuff Girls, yes, really, and uh, just try to hang around with my, my sister and her friends, which were all girls, and get along smashingly with them. So I was not particularly masculine in any sense, typically, anyway. So it was very difficult for me to actually get along with the boys in my school. But eventually, I got a rapport with some of them, and I decided to sort of broach the question. And I found that the only way you would get a guy to answer is if you do it jokingly. You never ask a guy, have you ever been sexually assaulted by a woman? And the answer is always no. You always start off, have you ever been kicked in the balls? How hilarious was that? <laughs> and you know what? It works. They'll just say, oh yeah, that happened. It hurt like hell. It was funny. It was amusing. And, and um, they just kind of brush it off, you know beat their chest about how invincible they all are, about how much pain they went through, but how it's okay, because, you know, she's a girl, she can't really do any real harm, apparently. And I found it quite amusing that almost every man that I managed to get the guts to get a rapport with, 
who did not wish to bully me for being too effeminate, which happened a lot, admittedly, as well, um, answered yes to that question. Every single guy that I managed to ask, and this, I, I admit this is not a government-funded survey that has been academically peer-reviewed, so this is therefore not science, technically, I suppose. This is one sample from one person. I wonder if we repeated it informally, whether or not the answers would be the same. I suspect if they did it in the same way that I did it, as equals, rather than as an authority asking very formal questions on a piece of paper, I would suggest the answer would be a very similar yes. <laughs> that's a lot of notes. <laughs> oh, that's all right, but you're giving an interesting talk, aren't you? Um, so, another interesting person in gender politics is a man called Warren Farrell. And this man was a president of the National Organization of Women in the, uh, the New York section of it, I believe. And he became famous for being very pro-abortion. He fought viciously for the rights of women to abort their children within a reasonable amount of time. And uh, among other things, such as girls in sports, was one of his other crusades. So this is a man, his early life was focused almost entirely on the issues that women face. And so what he would do is, when he spoke, in order to try to get the men to sort of understand what women were going through, what he would do is stand them all up and kind of walk them down an aisle and get them to do a sort of catwalk and have the women judge the men by how well they looked. And what he'd say to the men who did not look so well, well, you get no attention. And the men who looked well, obviously, got a lot of attention. And so he tried to get men to sort of understand what he referred to as the daily catwalk that many young women go through, and I'm sure every woman here can attest to something like that happening in their lives once or twice, maybe even six times. He eventually realized that the men weren't paying very much attention to this, they weren't really ex absorbing it, and he wondered why. He figured that maybe it was because it was a one-sided thing, where he was just asking the men to walk in the lady's shoes for a while and see what it's like, but not the other way. So he decided to do another little test. And remember, this was the 70s. Things have indeed changed a little bit since then. But what he did is he got all the women and set them according to how much they earned. And said to the women who had the potential to earn the most, you will be the ones to get the most male attention, and the women who got to earn the least will get the least male attention. So that was him attempting to sort of walk women through what men were going through. It's a very interesting thing that sort of happened once he started doing this. The men started listening to what he had to say, but the women were sort of back like this, sort of being very angry. And sort of eventually, since these were feminist talks that he was going to, and he was now not just talking about women's issues, he was talking about both equality, which is what that F word is allegedly about, he was not invited so much anymore. <laughs> it's a strange sort of thing that happened to this man who I, I believe, truly believes in the original feminist cause, anyway, even if he does not agree with its current version. You will see him very much praising it for the idea of getting girls into sports, which is indeed very important, and many other things. So I was very surprised when he decided, um, with an organization called uh, CAFE, which stands for Canadian Association for Equality, do a little speech on male suicide, and this was up until that point 
probably the most pro-feminist man I've seen in my entire life. So it was very interesting to see the protests by feminist organizations attempting to shut down the conversation on male suicide and on male issues that happened in Toronto and Canada. S police were called, barricades were put up. It's a very interesting turn of events. One that would be repeated again and again and now in Australia. Just last week, we uh, showed the red pill in the University of Sydney, and some of the people here are even at that event. It was last week, wasn't it? It was last, it was last week. Last. So much seems to have happened since then. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just last week, and it was amazing to see all of these people show up at a movie whose, whose objective was to kind of analyze the men's rights movement and men's issues. And so, interviewed Cassie J, the producer and star of the film. She interviewed men's rights activists, feminists, basically everyone. And got everyone's take on, on the issue. And eventually had the guts to come out with her own opinion at the end of the film. And that opinion has been quite the controversial thing. It is, I would argue, her opinion at the end of the film is the most controversial part of the film. It is the reason, well, one of the main two reasons, that the film has to be censored so radically by a certain segment of the feminist groups. And that is that she ends the film by saying that she no longer identifies as a feminist. What I noticed is that she didn't end the film saying, I now identify as a men's rights act activist and I am the avowed enemy of feminism. She didn't say that. But she, as far as many people were concerned, she may as well have said that. And that is what these protests attempting to shut down this event were reacting to. That quote, in and of itself. I found that protests, quote, to be quite confusing. They got a bullhorn and they talked about several men's issues. Men's issues such as uh, more likely to die at work, more likely to have uh, injuries at work, more likely to die in war, more likely to do uh, X, Y, and Z, all of this on. And then they asked the question, what are all of these Conveniently, they didn't mention domestic violence. But what do all of these issues have to do with feminism? They asked. Well, of all the answer, of all the issues that they raised, none of them actually had anything to do with feminism. And none of them in the movie, or by any person on the opposite side, were ever blamed on feminism. I, uh, <laughs> I sort of wonder about these girls in universities as to how they must see the world much different than I do. <laughs> I would very much like to have a sane conversation with some of them at, at some point, just to see how different their views are from mine, but I, I do believe that that objective in and of itself, at the present time, is impossible. Because I don't think any of them would talk 